day. Um, this wouldn't be possible. We wouldn't be able to even do this without wonderful innovators. And Mr. Tom Quinn traveled a long way. He's been out here with, how many days have you been here, Tom, with us? A couple weeks. A couple weeks. And the commitments and things you're going to learn from this presentation will be absolutely remarkable. So a round of applause for our next presenter, Mr. Tom Quinn, eFuels. I'm going to introduce something to you uh, during this presentation that I did at Stanford University in 2018. And the reaction, it was the International Energy Conference, and I was invited by Rick Reese, uh, uh, one of the professors at Stanford University, that caught, you know, the uh, engineering that we were doing uh, in this area and was, said, we need to have you as our guest speaker. So I said, you sure you want me? Because it's, it, we're going in a different path than what everybody else was doing. He goes, absolutely. So I will start off my presentation by saying when I presented it, and these were people from all over the world, uh, it was for a shock of what I, you know, I'm about to tell you people and show you people. Uh, it was also some anger because uh, when you have a market like energy, which is $5 trillion dollars, uh, and you disrupt that market, people get angry, you know, because their livelihood and the strength that their, uh, their corporations rely on it, and, and we all know that. When you're fighting uh, energy, I mean, that's, that's a big monster to fight, all right? But the, the end word was they were uh, excited, they were motivated that they had, and I'm going to announce today, uh, a renewable energy source, which is the largest in the world, that nobody knew about, existed. It's not only renewable, it's carbon negative, and it's free. And anybody can use it. And that's what I presented there. So where's my little clicker? Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about carbon negative. Uh, Everybody's heard about carbon or carbon neutral, all right? And if you thought, okay, let's freeze it right now and we're neutral. We don't go backwards, we don't go forward. Does that really accomplish anything? It can't, all right? So we gotta go carbon negative. We gotta quickly reverse, you know, what's going on in the energy and the planet, quickly. So, but let me give you my background first so you know that I have been down this path before, and I want to tell everybody that, you know, you, this is probably the first time you met me, but every one of you owns my technology, and I will walk you through it. If you ever played Nintendo Wii, I'm the inventor of the inertia, the, the inertia graphics control system that I patented myself, which allowed uh, the Nintendo Wii to uh, capture a uh, human motion or body mo a body movement of motion and interpret that on a graphical screen. And that was me. Now, you also have that when you go to uh, Google Maps, Apple Maps, and you're driving your car and you see as you're moving your car, the graphical screen is changing. Uh, that's me, all right? That's the inertia graphic control system. There are sensors in there that you know, assist the GPS in positioning uh, your vehicle on the map. Then I go back, oh, I use it still all the time, and my wife says, Can't, didn't you learn that direction yet? No, I love going with these maps. <laughs> so uh, Novell in the 80s, uh, those of you who may remember it, we pioneered the local area network. We pioneered, one of the biggest things we did was we mirrored uh, micro uh, computers so we can uh, daisy chain them together to uh, increase the efficiency of information. Now that today is known as the cloud and that's what I pioneered when I was president of Novell was that. And then that got the attention of Mr. Ch uh, Chairman Lee at Samsung uh, uh, in the 80s. And he asked me if I would come and help them start in San Jose, California, their computer division over there, which I did. 
uh, had a wonderful relationship with him. Uh, he has uh, since passed away, but uh, I started that organization. So I, I have been through this thing with Silicon Valley. I grew up with a lot of uh, uh, you know, competitive uh, uh, startup geniuses, Steve Jobs and uh, one of them, Wozniak, another one of them. But uh, that's my bio. So I took a look at the energy market starting in 2008. And what I found was very interesting. Uh, and I think we need to accept this when we understand the situation we're in right now with, with our planet, the cost of energy, and, and, and the deterioration of what we're seeing right now. What this says is, uh, why is global warming, how does global warming exist? What, the major problem, one of them, in addition to burning hydro, hydrocarbons, we all know that, okay, uh, is that the sun evolves around, uh, for the next five billion years, a stellar ev evolution that is predicted to increase in brightness by about 6% every one billion years. But the important thing here is, slowly increasing Earth's temperatures and boiling off of the ocean waters. That is happening at a rate of over 5 billion grams per second right now. And that means our sun is shrinking. It's not, in reality, it's not a renewable energy source. All right, granted it's gonna last a long time, but it's shrinking. And as that, the sun shrinks, the light becomes brighter and the heat intensifies. So now we, we have a problem that we can't fix, but we don't have to make it worse by digging and strip mining the planet and burning all the hydrocarbons and the planet and just stick it up into the atmosphere, right? I mean, we, we are really hurting this planet uh, really bad. And, you know, I always say when Earth has enough of humans, it's going to get rid of us. So we got to behave. All right. And I hope you understand that when I'm getting it. So, so I was researching and I came across a new energy source, which I couldn't believe. Uh, I was studying a chart and, you know, there's only one reason is it's been an egregious, what I call a major mistake from the science community that hasn't recognized it. And I'm gonna show you what I saw back in 2008. This is considered by the US Department of Energy as one of the most important annual charts. Very important chart. What this shows is it shows we have 100.2 quadrillionths of energy consumption in the United States. That's how much we consume. What's on here is all the energy sources that we use in the United States. Solar, nuclear, hydro, wind, geothermal, gas, coal, biomass, petrol, okay? This is everything. Now what happens is as you go to the right, you see the, the production of electrical power and then you have all the other industries down here for transportation, what have you. But, and it's almost off the chart there, but I'll let you, see this red arrow that I inserted there? It's almost 70% of the good energy. So over here is the raw energy that's coming in that we dig up into the planet. And it doesn't matter, uh, uh, renewables, you also have to dig for renewables. They don't grow on trees. So all these energy sources, along with uh, you know coal and natural gas and all this other, uh, petroleum, they're all going down here. And guess what? Almost 70%, 65 and a half, is going up into the atmosphere. And the most biggest egregious mistake we made was we called it carbon. Now it has carbon in it, but what it what they failed to understand is the energy here that comes in is heated carbons. That's very important. Heat, under science, and the thermal laws, which I'll get into, is mechanical energy. Me nothing in the world that humans make, all right, they can't make it without uh, heat, mechanical energy. When we eat food, and we walk, and we run, 
we're burning and rejecting energy that we got from the planet. We're no different from running, uh, you know, uh, any of these uh, uh, electrical or fuel uh, processing plants, okay? That's something we have to remember. Now, the other thing that I discovered, I researched what consumes more energy than anybody else in the industry. And I don't know if anybody knows that. Who do you think consumes the most energy in the world? I'll tell you. The fuel industry, and next, the power industry. They consume, so I'll give you an example. You fill up a brand new car with three gallons of fuel, okay? And you get in that car, and you drive until you consume all that fuel in the car. And then once you, you stop, you analyze, where did that energy go, all right? That energy went out the tailpipe, Two-thirds or up to 70% went out the tailpipe, uh, the f engine friction heat, and the radiator. And people say, well, I drive an electric vehicle. Okay, they also have a cooling system, and many people don't know that. There's only one purpose to have a cooling system in anything, is to reject heat. That is mechanical energy. So what, what I'm trying to, uh, you know, I, I surmised here what shocked everybody was the fact that the energy here is no different from the energy over there. Why are we throwing that mechanical heated energy into the atmosphere and always complain about it, but we never do anything? The simple technique is to take that over here and loop it back to here. It's perfectly good energy. And I hope everybody understands that. And I can, I can take further questions tomorrow during the Q&A. So, if we listen to our previous scientists, now there's what we call in fifth and sixth grade, they actually teach this in elementary school. They teach the laws of thermodynamics. And if we adults had to listen to it, what it says is uh, the, uh, the, the first is on the law is energy cannot be created or destroyed, but can be transferred from one form to another, right? So that means we, on that other chart, going back, all right, remember? This, we thought we destroyed this energy, so we called it waste. But in reality, it wasn't waste. It was good. Why? Because the laws tell us humans can't destroy energy. They can only transform it. That's very important to realize, okay? And the second law of thermodynamics says, Unless a thing, uh, hot things will cool unless you do something to stop them, right? So what the law, and this started in the 19, uh, 1500s. This is not something that was recent. These laws go back to the 1500s as they massaged them along the way. People were saying, you know, they were studying energy. So we have made one egregious mistake is thinking that, all right, we're injecting carbon into the atmosphere. All right, that's not all we're uh, injecting. We're rejecting heat, mechanical energy. Okay, so the next thing is, if you take that heat, right, and you use it again, instead of throwing it up in the atmosphere for uh, mechanical energy to move an automobile to electrical power generators, right, that becomes carbon negative because the point is, Right down here, and this came from the federal government, carbon negative means you remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than you emit, okay? So that same car that I said you drove uh, three gallons until it, 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 it consumed it all, if you were utilizing that uh, car, rejected energy, it would go the same distance with one gallon versus three gallons because now you used that rejected energy, all right? And that's where we're heading here. So, what we have here is, I'm gonna give you a shot uh, of over here, is that we, uh, e-fuel, over the course of the years, we combined a, f a fuel plant. Now, the fuel that we can make, we can make any fuel carbon negative. We can make transportation fuels. 
We can make jet fuel, and we can also make hydrogen. For I know because people are talking about hydrogen here. The problem with hydrogen is it's very expensive fuel, and the transportation of hydrogen is very dangerous to transport it. But with our technology, there's no need to transport it, and it's free. Because if you use rejected energy, all right, if you're producing power to the community and you're taking the heat from that generator and you're making hydrogen fuel, now that becomes a byproduct of a carbon negative hydrogen fuel. Okay? That's very important. If we want to get into hydrogen, we have to solve it. And the fact that the efficiencies uh, in our, what we call the rejected energy reactor system, is very small, which allows us to be portable. We can make hydrogen on demand, and by the way, we can make, hydro, uh, we can make dry ice uh, on demand, okay? Because now, with learning this that's been going on for 120 years, right? This, this very serious mistake we've made as, as, as a hum, humanity, we can now take this power, we can take the carbon and the heat, and we can make additional energy at zero cost, and we can provide products like uh, Kinoe was talking about. Now we have a free source of not only carbon, but we have a free source of energy. All right? And uh, I'll be more than happy to get into that and, and deeper uh, in tomorrow's discussion. Now, this is the sound of the engine running. And, and I believe we're going to stop that at one point where you'll be able to see. Now you can go back a little bit. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Okay. This is actually the RER system working we, as a display model. Okay. So, oh, there you go. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. So right over here is the exhaust port. If you notice, the exhaust port, which con contains the CO2 and the heat, is going into a reactor. And that reactor separates the heat so you can make fuel right there. The, the fuel plant's right behind it. You don't have to show it. But there's a fuel plant right behind it. So what happens in this is we fill it, okay, with uh, uh, fuel. And then that fuel then, uh, uh, we trap the rejected energy coming out, and we make more fuel with it. So now we're making two-thirds or up to 70% less fuel, right, than we put in. Now, does anybody catch what's going on there? If you implement this technology in a $5 trillion market, you wipe it out. Because for 120 years, we've been discarding this energy into our atmosphere, wrecking the planet, okay? And the worst part about it, and we don't talk about it enough, is we're strip mining this planet like it's a dead planet. And anybody that goes out and looks at what we're doing to our planet, uh, and I hate to say it, but some countries in the Pacific are now using amphibious tractors under the ocean to dig out carbons, right? I mean, we've gotten to the stage now that we've depleted a lot of the uh, cheap uh, uh, hydrocarbons on the top of the planet. Now we're going into the ocean for it. And are we expecting anything good to happen out of that? I don't think so. Just more death to the ocean, right? So, I, you know, I want everybody to understand that if you don't, I hope to have a chance to talk to you more as we proceed. Now... Photosynthesis. People ask me, well, how do you, uh, we term ourselves that we take carbon and we, we convert it into oxygen. And I've had PhDs and scientists, you can't do that. That's impossible. It, does, it can't happen. I said, wait a minute. Let's go back to fifth grade again. In elementary school, we learned what does photosynthesis do? Photosynthesis takes the carbon from, the air, uh, from our atmosphere, right? And it produces what? Sugar. And that process of taking carbon and producing sugar, okay, is the carbon negative, but it's also the only reason why any living thing on the planet exists. 
because of plants. Plants are critical to our life, and we have to really protect it. So when you talk about Hawaii, I know there's been a lot of discussions. I've talked with the group here from Dibs. They understand it. There's been a depletion of the soil on this beautiful, these beautiful islands, one of the most fertile soils in the world, right here in the state of Hawaii. All right, but they have been, uh, you know, abused and abandoned. Okay, and one of the things I've learned recently from the folks here is that if you leave the land alone, it comes back. Right? What does that tell you? Well, the humans are destroying what we had a blessing from to have, you know, the ability to grow uh, nice uh, food and, and other types of plants and trees, oxygen, right? We need oxygen, okay? That's another thing. And this is also a statement that shows you right, this, this right here, I got it from the federal government. It's the largest renewable energy source on the planet, right? And we've been ignoring it. No one's given attention to it. Instead, we go out, we build things, call them renewable, but this is the true renewable of what we need to be focusing on, okay? Now, this is another topic. What are we gonna do without oil? People say, let's get rid of oil, let's shut it down. You know what, we don't have to, because guess what? We're running out. People don't understand that. Most of all the major productions from the Middle East, the United States, to Russia, are injecting water under the ground for these oil pumps. And if anybody in science understands what that mean is, they don't have the pressure anymore to bring that oil from below the ground up to the surface, all right? That means we're running out of oil and we're running out fast. When President Biden went to the Middle East and says, pump me more oil, they came back and said, we're at a limit. In fact, if anything, we're gonna start reducing. And what happens and what we're seeing today is we're running out of oil. It's not because we want to get rid of oil. Oil's just running out. So it's one of those things, watch what you wish for, because it's going to happen whether we like it or not. All right? We got to get smart real fast and get fuel. And, 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 I'm, and this is important. Nothing manufactured in the world goes without fuel. Fuel touches everything. Okay, now we believe in an organic fuel, all right? And we can make the fuels we need for aviation, we can make the fuels for transportation, for power generation, we can make them from all the three major industries, all right? But we gotta get smart and we gotta get smart quick because I'm telling you, uh, it's gonna get worse. And guess who became the largest uh, corporation? It used to be Apple Computer, now who is the largest corporation in the world? Armaco, Middle East Oil, right? Once we went into this energy crisis where everything shot up, it's because the demand is there, but the quantity, the volume isn't there. This is telling us a warning sign, danger, danger. Even if we wanted oil, we're not gonna be able to get it to meet our growth in the future. So action has to be taken quickly and now. And so this is a slide that, you know, this is what it looks like for uh, mining for minerals. And it could be anything, you know, it, it, you know minerals could be in for, for uh, lithium. It could be for anything, all right? But we're, we're damaging the planet, all right? And nobody ever sees this, all right? I mean, it, it's just terrible what we're doing to it, all right? So what happens? What happens when e-fuel implements this on Hawaii? We're gonna implement this. Hawaii will be the first one in a major. We have an agreement between uh, an annual production rate of the first systems to come there, seven billion watts, okay? That's gonna make a dent in Hawaii, okay? Very fast. But what happens is, what can we expect here, okay? We're gonna push the cost of energy back to the 60s on Hawaii. Remember that. Exactly. 
This is a shot, obviously, from the 60s. Not only the power, but the fuel. You will have the lowest cost fuel in the United States, if not the world, when you implement this. Because guess what? We're going to use that rejected energy against the energy industry. It's a free weapon that's been at our disposal. We just haven't used it. Okay? So this is going to be a very exciting time for us. Uh, you know, to watch this transition. And, you know, it's, it's really not a renewable energy product. What we're doing is we're just being smart. We're saying we're tired of wasting good energy, and we're going to use it, and we're going to use it against the power industry because that means every time you use rejected energy, you're not taking more fuel, you're not taking more power to make that, you know, uh, the fuel to make the power, all right? It goes in reverse, all right? And that means you're going to see a major power reduction. So we did a little, uh, you know, with my chief technical officer, we did a little uh, napkin at, at, at uh, I think it was a Mexican restaurant uh, uh, not too long ago. And we said, all right, let's look at Hawaii. Let's look at the islands here. Uh, the islands are, are consuming about 9.5 trillion watts of, of energy, okay? It's a lot. It's a big number, okay? And so if you were to take uh, on a biomass energy basis, it would take you about uh, 6 million tons to go completely carbon negative on the islands, okay? Now, we may have got a math wrong, but that's very close to what we can do, all right? So and what better place to do it than with all this fertile soil? And as we've already talked about, we all know what carbon can do for our lands, okay? Like was mentioned, the dry ice, the baking sodas and products and all that other stuff is available to us by putting this uh, technology to work. These are shots of eFuels uh, products. This is one, uh, it's in Australia, South Wales. And this is our farming product where it takes uh, helps the farmers water and it captures the carbon and takes the carbon and puts it into the water so it goes directly into the plants. This is a product that uh, has been very popular through our years. It's called a microfueler. It's, a, it's actually a fuel plant. You know, it's a microfuel plant. And we've sold them all over the world. And that technology is the base technology that we're using uh, to make the reactor. So we can uh, produce fuel as we produce electrical power. So uh, I already went through with this with you in the feedstocks and stuff like that. And that's it. Thank you for my time.